Good morning, everyone. We are going to get started. I just got my roster printed out. Looks like everyone is here this morning, which is awesome. So let's start with just taking roll. Um, if I take roll, then we don't have an attendance question. So that's kind of our trade off. If I take roll, we're cool. If there's not a lot of people in class that day, I'm going to do an attendance question, which is based on what we do in, in class. So if you miss class, then you might miss your attendance question. So that's kind of what's my reasoning there. Um, okay, so if I call your name, just please unmute and let me know that you are here, please. Amy. Is Amy Arcel here? Actually, I think I cut off the first letter of your last name. Okay, I don't, there's no Amy. Danielle. Danielle, are you here? Okay, Eric. Kirsten. I know there's a lot of people here today, so I'm a little surprised. Kira. Did I print out the wrong roster? I think I did. That would explain it. <laughs> Hold on one second. Let me get the right roster printed. I think I printed out anatomies instead of physiology. So that would be my mistake. Yeah. Okay, well, that is going to be printing. We are going to finish talking about macromolecules today. I have several videos lined up to kind of um, kind of back up a little bit to go over some of the topics we've already discussed for macromolecules, um, just to kind of help illustrate what we've been talking about, because we've been kind of just scratching the surface and there's so much more to it. So. When you do watch these videos today, I want you to take notes because there are important points in there that I do want you to take note of. And after the video, if there's something really important I want you to make sure to remember, I will let you know, okay? All right, let's try, let's try this again. Kayla, are you here? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Reagan. Here. Kelsey. Here. Okay. Tana. Here. Bailey. Ba Bailey Fulmer. Okay. Stevie. Here. Thank you. Josh. Josh Kettle. Here. Okay, Joel Langermeyer. Here. Taylor Lobetta. Here. Taylor Lavelle. Here. Thank you. Grace. Here. Andrew Marr. Here. Thank you. Amber. Here. Jimmy. Jimmy Nguyen. Okay. Yuen Nguyen. You know yawning's contagious, right? <laughs> okay. Marissa. Patcha. Here. Okay. Here. Thank you. Jamie. Jamie Plague or Plague. I see you're on there. Okay. I see you there. And Jeanette. Here. Here. 
Thank you. Morgan? Here. Thank you. Macy? Here. Ayla? Here. Elijah? Here. Araya? Araya White? Okay. Ava? Here. Okay, perfect. Did I miss anyone? This is an up-to-date roster, so it should be, should be right. Okay. So we're going to start this lecture off with kind of going back a little bit on macromolecules just so that we can review a few topics that I think are important for you to know. So let's go. Oh, no, that's not the right one. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to, we're going to scroll back a little bit and then we'll come back to the nucleic acids. So just I know we're backing up, so I apologize about that, but I do like to include videos, but it is going to be a little bit of a video rich day, so please forgive me for that, but again, it is educational and will help reinforce what we've been talking about. <clears throat> okay, so we have kind of a, we have a video on macromolecules. Oh, let me actually... I have to do it this way, then the link will work. So this is covering macromolecules. And I do like to use one person in particular on YouTube, the crash course in biology. He is really good. He knows his stuff and he's very accurate. So you'll, you'll see that very often I do use him because I, I think that he's a great resource. So if you want to look up videos Hello, to help, sorry, if you want to look up videos to help, he is a great person to do it. Okay. Sorry, now I'll be quiet. And he's funny. Oh no, but your game just get interrupted by an update. Oh no, let's skip. Oh, sorry, we can't skip. This is the wrong video. I don't know what happened. Please forgive me, guys. There's a technical difficulty. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Something happened. I am sorry. Oh my goodness. Sorry. Hello. There we go. And welcome to the kitchen. I wanted to invite you here today because last week we started off in my bathroom and I kind of feel bad about that. And also because as I'm taking lunch today, I wanted to, you know, some use this as a lab. During this time in my kitchen, I'm going to talk to you about three different things. One, the three most important molecules on the earth. Two, possibly the grossest sandwich I'm ever going to eat, and three, uh, an obscure scientist who taught us everything that we know about urine. Are we supposed to have a video? So far we've talked about carbon and we've talked about- water. Amy, we can't see the video. You can't? Okay, one sec. Thank you for telling me. Okay, maybe let's see what I need to do. Um, it says I am screen sharing. Oh, okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, thank you. And also because as I'm taking lunch today, I wanted to do some use this as a lab. During this time in my kitchen, I'm going to talk to you about three different things. One, the three most important molecules on the earth. Two, possibly the grossest sandwich I'm ever going to eat. And three, uh, an obscure scientist who taught us everything that we know about urine. <laughs> So 
far we've talked about carbon and we've talked about water. And now we're going to talk about molecules that make up every living thing and every living thing in every living thing. I don't care if you're a bacterium or if you're a blue whale or if you're Lady Gaga or if you're a mite living on the Queen of England's eyelashes. They're called biological molecules. These aren't just building blocks. These are the molecules necessary for every living thing on Earth to survive. They are essential sources of energy. They are the means of storing that energy. They are also the instructions that all organisms use to be born, to grow, and ultimately pass those same instructions on to the future generation. They are the ingredients for life. And we call them the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and the nucleic acids. And today we're just going to be talking about the first three. It's that there were three ingredients necessary for life. And it turns out that all organisms either need to synthesize or ingest those ingredients in order to live. We're going to start out with the most basic of these ingredients for life, and that is the carbohydrate. You've no doubt heard of them. You may, in fact, be avoiding them like the plague. But the fact is that nothing and no one can avoid carbohydrates because they are the source of all energy that we have available to us. Carbohydrates are made up of sugars, and the simplest of them are called monosaccharides. Mono, for one, saccharides for the actual root of the word sugar. The star of the show here is glucose, because it's truly fundamental, by which I mean like number one on the global food chain, because it comes from the sun. All biological energy was originally captured from the sun by plants as glucose through photosynthesis. And every cell that needs energy uses glucose to get that energy through a process called respiration. In addition to glucose, there are other monosaccharides like fructose, which has the same molecular formula as C6H12O6, but arranged differently. These subtle chemical differences do matter. Fructose, for example, is significantly sweeter than glucose. It's also processed by our bodies in different ways. And then there are disaccharides, which, like the name says, are just two monosaccharides put together. And the most famous of these is sucrose, which is simply a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule joined by a covalent bond. Mono and disaccharides are pretty much little niblets of energy that are really easy for our bodies to process. But when these carbohydrates start to form into longer and longer chains, their function and their roles change as well. Instead of being sources for instant energy, they become storehouses of energy or structural compounds. These are polysaccharides. Instead of being just two or three monosaccharides put together, polysaccharides can contain thousands of simple sugar units. And because they're so big and burly, they're great for building with. In plants, cellulose is the most common structural compound. It's just a bunch of glucose molecules bound together, and it is the most common organic compound on the planet. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to digest. Cows can do it, but humans certainly cannot, which is why you don't enjoy eating grass. Polysaccharides are also really good for storing energy and not just structurally, but just as an energy store. And that's where we get bread. Now, really interesting thing here, uh, bread made up of starch, uh, the most simple of which is called amylose. Amylose and cellulose look almost exactly identical, but one is grass and the other is bread. Like chemistry. Plants store glucose in the form of starch and it comes in lots and lots of different forms from roots and tubers to the sweet flesh of fruits to the starchy seeds of the wheat plant that end up being milled into flour. Ground up grain is the main ingredient in the bread, of course, and most of the calories or the energy content comes from carbohydrates. When I eat this, I'm gonna be eating all of the chemical energy that uh, this wheat plant uh, got from the sun in order to feed its next generation of seeds that we then stole uh, for our own use. All for me. Now we as human beings can't grow fruits or tubers, so we have to store our energy in a couple of different ways. The way that we tend to store carbohydrate energy is in glycogen, very similar to amylose or starch, but has more branches and is more complicated. It's basically made up of the glucose that we have left over after we eat, and it sits in our muscles really, really ready to use, and it's also stored in our liver. It's generally a pretty short-term store. If we don't eat for like a day, pretty much all of our glycogen gets depleted. But over the longer term, the way that we store our energy is through fat. All of our mom's worst enemies, the fat, which turn out to be actually really important and are the most familiar sort of a very important biological molecule, the lipid. Lipids are smaller and simpler than complex carbohydrates and they're grouped together to 
because they share an inability to dissolve in water. This is because their chemical bonds are mostly nonpolar. And since water, as we learned in the previous episode, despises nonpolar molecules, uh, the two do not mix. It's like oil and water. In fact, it's exactly like oil and water. And if you've ever read a nutrition label or seen this thing called the television, we're probably pretty conversant in the way that we classify fats. But then, you know, 99% of us have no idea what those classifications actually mean. Fats are made up mainly of two chemical ingredients, glycerol, which is a kind of alcohol, and fatty acids, which are long carbon hydrogen chains that end in a carboxyl group. When you get three fatty acid molecules together and connect them to a glycerol, that's a triglyceride. These feature prominently in things like butter and peanut butter and oils and uh, the white parts of meat. These triglycerides can either be saturated or unsaturated. And I know that when we put the word fat and saturated into the same sentence, it sounds like an evening at KFC. But here we're talking about being saturated with hydrogen. As you hopefully remember from our first lesson, carbon is very nimble in how it uses its four electrons to form single or double or even sometimes triple bonds. This means that if the carbon atoms in a fatty acid are connected to each other with single bonds, all the carbon atoms end up connected to at least two hydrogen atoms. One of them picks the third. So the fatty acid is saturated with hydrogen. But when some of the carbon atoms are connected to each other with double bonds, all of those carbon electrons are spoken for, and so they're not able to pick up those hydrogen atoms. This means that they're not saturated with hydrogen, and they are unsaturated fatty acids. To demonstrate, may I direct your attention to this jar of peanut butter? Here you can kind of see both kinds of fat. The liquid stuff you see at the top here, that is the unsaturated fat, which we generally think of as oils. Paste of stuff down here also contains lots of unsaturated fat, but also contains saturated fat, which doesn't have any double bonds, so it can pack more tightly and form solids at room temperature. And there are also other fat classifications that you've heard of. Trans fats, which everyone tells you never to eat. They're right, don't eat them. They don't exist in nature, and they're basically unsaturated fatty acids that instead of kinking, go straight across, and so they're extra super bad for you. Don't eat them. Omega-3 fats are fatty acids that are unsaturated at the three position, which is like right there. Then that's the only difference. But the, the reason why these are important is because we can't synthesize them ourselves. They're essential fatty acids, meaning that we need to eat them in order to get them. All of this is starting to make me pretty hungry. But before we get to uh, more food stuff, there are some unappetizing sort of lipids that we also need to talk about. So remember that triglycerides are three fatty acids connected to glycerol. Swap one of those fatty acids out for a phosphate group and you have a phospholipid. These make up cell membrane walls. Since that phosphate group gives that end a uh, polarity, it's attracted to water. The other end is nonpolar and it avoids water. So if you were to scatter a bunch of phospholipids into some water, they would automatically arrange themselves like this, with the hydrophobic ends facing each other and the hydrophilic ends sticking out to face the water. Every cell in your body uses this natural structure to form its cell wall in order to keep the bad stuff out and the good stuff in. Another class of lipids is the steroids. Steroids have a backbone of four interconnected carbon rings which can be used to form hundreds of variations. The most fundamental of them is cholesterol, which binds with phospholipids to help form cell walls. But these can also be activated to turn into different lipid hormones. And so now we approach the most complicated, powerful, polymorphously awesome chemicals in our body, the protein. And by complicated, I mean that they are probably the most complicated chemical compounds on the planet. In fact, they're so amazing that we're going to do a separate episode on them and how they are created by DNA. But right now, in you, there are tens of thousands of proteins doing everything they can to keep you alive. There are enzymes regulating chemical processes, helping you digest food. There are antibodies connecting themselves to invaders like bacteria and viruses so that your immune system can get them. There are protein endorphins that like mess around with your brain and make you like feel emotions. They're everywhere, they do everything. And proteins do all of this stuff using just 20 different ingredients and these are the amino acids. Just like fatty acids, amino acids have a carboxyl group at one end, and on the other end, they have an amino group, amino acid. Ah, now, hey, I don't know if you noticed this, but this is the first time that nitrogen has shown up in our food. 
this is super important because despite the fact that nitrogen is like everywhere, it's like 80% of the air, we can't just pull it out of the air and put it into our bodies. We have to get nitrogen from food. And so we have to eat foods that are high in protein, like this egg, which by its very virtue, because it is uh, all the white part is protein, it contains a goodly amount of nitrogen. Now in the middle of the amino and the acid group is a carbon, and it shares one of its electrons with good old hydrogen, and the other electron is free to be shared with R which is just a kind of fill in the blank. We call it the R group. It can also be called a side chain, and there are 20 different kinds of side chains. Whatever fits in that blank will determine the shape and the function of that amino acid. So if you put this in there, you get valine. It's an amino acid that does a lot of stuff like protecting and building muscle tissue. If you put this in there, you get tryptophan, which may be best known for its role in helping you regulate mood and energy levels. Amino acids form long chains called polypeptides. Proteins are formed when these polypeptides not only connect, but elaborate in, frankly, really elegant structures. They fold, they coil, they twist. If they were sculptures, I would go to the museum every day just to look at them, and I'd walk straight past the news without even looking. But protein synthesis is only possible if you have all of the amino acids necessary, and there are nine of them that we can't make ourselves. Histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. By eating foods that are high in protein, we can digest them down into their base particles and then use these essential amino acids in building up our own proteins. Some foods, especially ones that contain animal protein, have all of the essential amino acids, including this egg. And that concludes this triple-decker sandwich of biological awesomeness, which is all we need to be happy, healthy people. And I'm sure, because of that, it's going to be delicious. Nope. Thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course. We'll be discussing something else very interesting next week. I don't know. Okay. So he's fun. Um, let's go back to our, oh, I couldn't read your messages when the video was playing. Let me double check our, our chats. Will it show up? Come on. I'm having trouble with the chat. If you have a question or comment, please just say something because for some reason I can, oh, there's the chat. I can see you, yes, yes, okay. All right, um, so a little review on what was going on in the video. Um, by the way, that was a gross looking sandwich, nasty. Um, he was just kind of doing some of the surface stuff, but I liked how he showed you how the phospholipids, when you put them in water, automatically form two layers, that phospholipid bilayer, which is so biologically important, okay? Um, we will watch a separate video on nucleic acids after we talk about them for a bit. Um, we are actually quite ahead of the game as far as where we are in class and our schedule. So that's why we're going a little slower today is because we are ahead. So I will try to slow down with our lectures so we are not so far ahead. But that does help when we have, um, so for example, let's see, when is your first test? Why does that not show? I think your first quiz or your first test, let's just double check that. I think it'd be good for us to look at that together real quick. So let's go to there and we'll go to Canvas really quick because I want to make sure we, no, stop talking. Okay, modules, syllabus. Come on. Yes. Oh, it just didn't show up in my printed thing. Okay. So on Monday, 
unfortunately you still have a quiz due it is labor day how about i push that till tuesday would that be okay with everyone so you don't have to do a quiz on labor day so just this once because of the holiday, your quiz two is gonna be due on Tuesday, okay? So you can make a note of that. And your first exam is the 14th. Okay, good. All right, now we can go back to our lecture. I'm going to scroll through real quick stuff we've already done to see if there's a topic. Why is my pointer is not working? Please forgive me. While I figure out what's going on. Okay. So remember the importance of dehydration synthesis. And oh my goodness, why do I always blank on the second one? hydrolysis. Okay, so when we're talking about molecules forming, coming together, so monosaccharides coming together, that is dehydration synthesis. That's not showing the right picture. But when they're, you're breaking bonds, that's hydrolysis. So you're using water and you're splitting it. So those two um, topics or those two ideas, um, they're interchangeable, they're reversible essentially. And you most definitely will need to know what they are and be able to recognize. If I show you a, an equation like um, what you see on the screen, can you see my PowerPoint screen right now? Yeah, okay. So if you see molecules like that and you see that they're split after the equation, you should be able to know that that was hydrolysis or the reverse. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to make sure I use some pictures in your second quiz to help with this. So make sure you can recognize that. Okay, proteins is a big deal. You need to be able to know what are the subunits for an amino acid. So you have that central carbon atom, you have that single hydrogen atom by itself. Can I, right there. Then you have your amino group. The nitrogen, so you learned in the video, although there is a lot of nitrogen in the air, we cannot fix it in our body. Plants are actually what fix the nitrogen from the air and into tissues, and then animals eat those tissues. And then if you eat animals, if you eat meat, you get that from animal protein. Um, just an FYI, um, I'm a vegetarian. And you are truly able to get all of those essential amino acids from vegetarian sources. But there's, um, so for example, there's a few sources that do have all the essential amino acids like soybeans, big source of amino acids. Um, but it is typically true that you need to kind of eat multiple sources of plants to get the amino acids you need. Whereas if you eat something from an animal like an egg or milk or meat, that you can get it from one source, okay? Um, then you have your carboxyl group, and then that R is your variable side chain or your functional group. He called it the side chain or the R group in the video. Okay, remember um, forming polypeptides, which is two, two or more amino acids joined together through dehydration synthesis, that bond that holds them together is the peptide bond. So the peptide bond is unique to proteins only. You will definitely need to know that. Okay. So folding protein shape. And this is one thing I thought would be neat to have a little more illustration of. I know I've shown you pictures of the protein shape and folding but I thought it'd be nice to watch a short video kind of being able to see it in three-dimensional shape and talk a little bit more about why it is important for that three-dimensional shape with proteins. That shape determines the function. And if that shape is off just a tiny bit, like I mentioned before, 
then that protein will not be able to function properly and you are gonna have a problem that can be the source of many diseases. So let's see, let's see how long this video is first. If I can get my, I don't know what's wrong. For some reason, my pointer is not showing up. Oh no. You guys have any ideas? How can I get my arrow to show up again? Okay, there we go. Oh no. Oh, I just realized what I can do. <laughs> okay. So protein, this, the four levels of structure, just to review this really quick, you have your primary structure, which is those individual amino acids joined together through that peptide bond. And it's just like a strand of amino acids or that chain of pearls, okay? Secondary structure is when they coil or you get those pleated sheets. Tertiary structure is when it folds in on itself and forms a three-dimensional shape. Then that quaternary structure is when you have two or more of those tertiary structures joined together to form a large protein molecule, that three-dimensional shape. And the one that the protein that we've talked to before that is a macromolecule, that quaternary structure was the hemoglobin molecule. So let's see, whoops. There's my, there's my pointer. Give me one second, see if we can get that video. I'm not gonna show it if it's too long, if it will pop up. No, it's short. Okay, let me share this screen with you. So this is just a short little video. There we go. Welcome to Five Minute Scroll. In today's oh, this is the one I've shown you before. Never mind. I don't like this one. <laughs> Sorry about that. We are gonna back up or just keep going because I thought it was a different video. Okay. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay. Enzymes. Now this is one I do have a video for because I don't think we covered enzymes in enough detail. Um, and it's gonna help to kind of visualize this better. So enzymes are proteins. They are the complete protein, a quaternary structure, has a three-dimensional shape, and that shape determines function. I know I've said it so much, you're gonna see this on a quiz or an exam. Shape determines function. You've gotta know that. Okay, so the shape of, a pro of an enzyme determines whether or not it's going to work, whether or not it can bind to a substrate and cause a reaction to occur. Important to remember that enzymes lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction and allow that reaction to actually take place. Without an enzyme present, many chemical reactions would not be able to take place in your body. So enzymes play an incredibly important role. So with that, let's see if we can get our enzyme video going. I think we, we only have, then we're gonna go into nucleic acids and do some more lecture time, okay? Let me pause that really quick. At Steel Series, <sighs> we solve problems, not climate change level problems. Sorry, future generations, video based problems. When gamers communicated by taping microphones to their faces. Seriously? No way. So Something's not working here. Attach mic to headset. The gaming headset. There we go. Can you see the screen? Okay, I see people nodding. All right. So one little note. It seems this video seems kiddish, but they actually do talk about the the information in good detail. They just have kind of cartoonish um, animations. So please don't let that distract you, okay? Is it 
odd to have a favorite protein? Well, I don't think so. Probably because my favorite protein happens to remind me of one of my favorite childhood games, Pac-Man. If you haven't played Pac-Man before, then chances are we're much, much older than you. But now you can play it on Google. Just Google Pac-Man. It's a Google Doodle. Anyway, I digress. But see, in Pac-Man, you have this little character. It goes around, finds these pebbles, and the pebbles fit right into it. Well, a lot of illustrations that you will find of enzymes, they happen to look, at least us, a lot like Pac-Man. I remember P for Pac-Man and P for protein. Most enzymes are protein. Now, in the game, we mentioned there are these little pebbles that Pac-Man goes after. Well, enzymes have a specifically shaped area called an active site where items can bind. The items are called substrates. It's very specific binding because the active site is specifically shaped for the substrate that binds there. Very specific. So what happens when a substrate binds an enzyme? Well, usually the substrate is held there with some weak bonds because it's not gonna stay there forever. Something called induced fit will happen, which means the active site can change its shape even more to bind that substrate, like an enzyme substrate hug. The enzyme can either build up or break down the substrates that specifically bind to it, and we call the resulting item the product. An enzyme has the ability to really speed up reactions. Reactions that technically could happen on their own, but with the help of enzymes, they can be sped up to make processes effective for life. Let me give you a great real life example. The enzyme lactase. Another really cool thing about enzymes is that they often end in ASE, like lactase. Many sugars, on the other hand, end in OSE, and lactose is an example of a sugar. Lactose is a disaccharide, meaning it contains two sugar molecules bound together. We don't actually digest it so well in that form. It's big. The enzyme lactase has the ability to break lactose down into smaller parts that our body can digest. And this is a lot better option than waiting for a chemical reaction with lactose to happen spontaneously. Now with the lactase enzyme, lactose can be broken down quickly and digested. Now, there are some people that do not produce enough lactase. They can be what we call lactose intolerant, which means that if they consume foods that have lactose, such as milk, it can make them sick. They can't break the lactose down efficiently without lactase. In that example, one thing to point out, lactase, the enzyme, can break down a lot of lactose, the substrate. The lactase doesn't get used up in the reaction. It's still there. We call enzymes a catalyst because they can be used over and over and over and over in the reaction. By the way, your digestive system uses all kinds of enzymes. So you have lipase, and that breaks down lipids, which are fats. You have amylase, which breaks down starch. You have protease, which breaks down proteins. So as you can see, the digestive system is very involved with enzymes. Another thing to point out is that Enzymes don't always work alone. Sometimes they get some help. Some often underappreciated but essential little helpers are called cofactors and coenzymes. They may bind to the substrate or to the active site. They help the enzyme do its job of building up or breaking down substrates into products. Now, you didn't forget our Pac-Man analogy yet, right? In the game Pac-Man, there are these ghosts. And when they touch the Pac-Man, it makes this sound. It's like, no, 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 no. And the Pac-Man shape gets all distorted in the process. So what does this have to do with enzymes? No, there aren't ghosts around. But enzymes do have certain ideal conditions that they like. For example, an enzyme that is in your stomach would have an ideal pH that is very acidic because the environment in your stomach is very acidic. Different enzymes have different ideal pH and temperature ranges. If an environment changes out of an enzyme's ideal pH or temperature range, then something that reminds me a lot of that horrible sound I tried to make can happen. The enzyme becomes denatured. That means its shape becomes distorted. It can no longer bind to its substrate. It can no longer work correctly. It is finished. Well, that's a dramatic end to enzymes. Keep in mind that if you have an interest in this topic, 
many medical researchers have a large focus on enzymes. Enzymes regulate a lot of the body processes and many diseases can involve specific enzyme production or the lack of it. Well, that's it for the new Okay. So it was short and sweet talking about enzymes. Let's see, go back to where we were. Oh no. Let's see. So an important point that she they just kind of brushed over really quickly was the coenzyme cofactors. And so cofactors and coenzymes, you need to know what these are. So a quick review. So cofactors helps the enzyme do its function. And these are typically minerals. So for example, you see calcium, magnesium, copper, and zinc are great examples of cofactors that help those enzymes do their job. So if you take a multivitamin, a daily multivitamin, go look at the, the um, ingredient list and you'll see that there are a lot of minerals listed. Those are cofactors. That's why you take the, those multivitamins to get them. You can also get it from your diet, but if you're concerned you're not getting a balanced diet, a multivitamin really helps make sure you get those vitamins and minerals that you need. So vitamins and minerals are cofactors. Coenzymes. These are molecules that we, we talked about this before and we'll definitely go in more detail with coenzymes when we do metabolism, but they pick up hydrogen molecules. And that, seem, that may seem like not a big deal, but it does play an important role in your metabolism. So examples of coenzymes is NAD and FAD. Notice they have a positive charge. So they have a positive charge, they're gonna attract hydrogen ions. Okay. I don't think we need to do much over lipids again. So I'm just gonna go through this really quick. Remember the difference between saturated and unsaturated and the implications that has. Um, let's see. I wanna get to nucleic acids so we have time. Okay, nucleic acids. And if we have time after we talk about nucleic acids, then we'll watch the video. We'll just see how it goes. Okay. So these are large organic molecules. So remember, organic means it has carbon in it. You find them in the nucleus. And their whole job is to basically store information. It's basically nucleic acids, DNA, code for proteins. And so we'll talk about how that works. So the big one that most people know about is DNA deoxyribonucleic acid. And yes, you need to know the whole word. So it's broken down into deoxy, ribonucleic, or ribo, sorry, there you go, and then nucleic. So it's made up of several components. And these determine inherited characteristics like the color of your eyes, the shape of your nose, and whether or not you have a bendy pinky finger. That's truly an inherited characteristic. Does anybody have a bendy pinky finger? That's inherited. Yeah, look at your finger. If, they, if the last joint bends in, that's inherited. If you have a straight one, that's inherited too. I know, it's silly. Okay, DNA directs protein synthesis. And this is a big topic that we, we won't cover in huge detail today. We will cover it in more detail later, but we'll try to cover it a little bit today. DNA also controls enzyme production. Enzymes are proteins most of the time. So DNA codes for protein. It makes sense that it also code for proteins that make up enzymes. So it has a very important role with enzymes. The other nucleic acid that's pretty common is ribonucleic acid. Ribo for the sugar, ribose, and nucleic referring to nucleic acids. 
So I'm sorry, up here when we talked about deoxy, deoxy is a sugar, I should have said that. Okay. All right, so RNA controls the intermediate steps of protein synthesis. And this is a quite a process that occurs. So first we need to talk about the structure of nucleic acids. Oops, I can't see that, let me fix this. Okay, so DNA and RNA are made up of long chains of nucleotides. And there are four main nucleotides for DNA. Okay, so DNA and RNA both contain a sugar, either deoxyribose or ribose. So that's the first part of the word. Then a phosphate group, Phosphate, we're going to see, comes up a lot as an important molecule in physiology. And then a nitrogenous base. So for DNA, you have adenine, which is A, guanine, which is the G, thymine, which is the T, and cytosine, which is the C. In RNA, instead of thymine, it uses uracil. So uracil is unique to RNA. So if we're looking here, this first picture is showing you the basic nucleotide structure. So you have your phosphate group, your five carbon sugar, and then your nitrogenous base. What differs between the nucleotides is that nitrogenous base. Oh, pardon me. So, Looking at the nitrogenous bases, we have, there are five total. Remember, uracil is only found in RNA. And then conversely, thiamine is only found in DNA. So here we can see the structure of these nucleotides, and they are very similar. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why I'm yawning. I've had my coffee. The three on top are called pyrimidines. So cytosine, uracil, and thiamine are pyrimidines. You'll need to know which category they fit into. And then guanine and adenine are purines. So they're just different categories that you need to know. Okay. When we look at the difference between the sugars and, D and DNA and RNA, the ribose has a hydroxy group, I mean, yeah, hydroxyl group, and the deoxyribose just has a hydrogen. It's very, it's only different with an oxygen that makes these two sugars different, so they're very similar. Okay, DNA is made up of a pair of nucleotide chains, and we would call these complementary strands. So DNA is a double-stranded molecule that, um, let's see, so you have, it forms what we call a double helix, okay? And then between those strands are your nucleotide bases. So what holds these strands together Oh, I'm so sorry. Or hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonding is, again, very important. And that holds them together and forms that twisting double helix. RNA is single-stranded. And you have several types of RNA. Messenger RNA is also referred to as mRNA. And we'll talk about the function of that later. Transfer RNA or tRNA, and then ribosomal RNA or rRNA. You definitely need to know the different RNA molecules. Okay, this is kind of a busy picture, but it shows you, first of all, the difference between an RNA molecule and a DNA molecule, single stranded versus double stranded. Oh my goodness. I don't know. Okay, so single-stranded 
If we look at the top up here, we can see we have our phosphates and our sugar. It forms our phosphate backbone, okay? And then attached to it, we have our nucleic acid. And what joins two nucleic acids together to form that bridge in the DNA that forms that double helix is that hydrogen bond joins those two amino acids together. So what happens is that you have complementary base pairing where the purines and the pyrimidines pair, pair together. So if we back up to remember which ones are our pyrimidines and our pyramines. So our pyrimidines is cytosine, uracil, and thymine. So pyrimidines, sorry, my handwriting is terrible. Pyrimidines, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. And our purines then would be adenine and guanine, okay? So with our complementary base pairing, our pyrimidines and our purines will pair together. So for example, if I have an adenine, the base pair that's going to pair with it is going to be thiamine, always. Adenine and thiamine are basically their base pairs. They pair together. They don't pair with anybody else. Cytosine pairs with guanine. So this is with DNA. With RNA, it's a little bit different. Adenine pairs with uracil, and then you still have cytosine that pairs with guanine. Okay. <clears throat> so just going over that again, adenine always bonds to thymine and DNA, and cytosine always bonds to guanine. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna drink a little more coffee. Okay, RNA molecules. Uracil replaces thymine. So in that case, we have adenine binds to uracil and RNA only. Must remember that uracil is unique to RNA. Okay, this table is just kind of a summary showing you the differences between RNA and DNA. Note the big difference here, uracil and thymine <clears throat> are the big difference in the nitrogenous bases. DNA is much longer, has many, many more, millions more nucleotide bases than RNA. RNA is typically short. DNA is very, very long. <clears throat> RNA is a single strand, whereas DNA is a double strand. So single strand, double strand. And what's cool is RNA can actually have different shapes too, depending on which type of RNA it is, but it's still always single stranded. And then the function is different between RNA and DNA as well. RNA is directly involved in protein synthesis in one way or another. DNA is the storage molecule for genetic information, the storage molecule for the coding for protein synthesis. Okay, here we have an illustration showing you the three types of RNA molecules. Messenger RNA, the first one, Typically long, single strand. It's not folded or anything like that. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. A long, single strand, and attached to it, you have your nucleotide bases. Because it's RNA, you have uracil instead of thymine. Ribosomal RNA is directly involved with protein synthesis. So when we talk about transcription and translation, we'll talk about ribosomes. Uh, ribosomes are essentially um, made up of ribosomal RNA. They're two subunits that come together to form a ribosome. And it, the ribosome is essentially the machinery for protein synthesis. 
And then last you have transfer RNA or tRNA and its job is to carry individual amino acids. I don't, I'm so sorry. To carry individual amino acids to the protein um, manufacturing site at the ribosome to transfer the amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain. Oh, are we seriously done? Sorry, I'm a little surprised. Okay, we are definitely going to be talking, talking more about DNA and protein synthesis later. This was just a quick overview. Um, so I promise you there will be more. I know you're super excited about that. So let me find the slide that has our video so we can review nucleic acids. That's the one. Um, when we talk about the cell, which is the next chapter, this is when we're gonna talk about protein synthesis and go into more depth with the different RNA molecules and DNA and RNA transcription and translation. All of that is in our next chapter. So I'm not skipping in the information, it is coming up, I promise. So there is a lot more to learn, we're just going over the four basic macromolecules in this chapter. And so we are definitely finishing this chapter and you will be ready for your quiz, which I postponed till Tuesday because of the holiday. Um, but on Tuesday the 8th, we will start with talking about the cell. This will take more, this will take some time. So we have two days set aside for it. We're gonna just go slowly through it because there's a lot of information. So we will, we're still ahead of the game. Okay, so let's see if we can get our nucleic acid video going and then we'll be done for the day. We are so on track, this is great. <clears throat> Okay, let me figure out how to share this video. Uh-oh. Okay. Hold on. That's not the right video. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's just, it's a Can you guys see this? I think I shared my screen right. I just want to be sure you can see it. And I did get the chat uh, question if I could share the links for these videos. Yes, I will. I'm going to write myself a note. You should have those links up tonight. So links for macromolecule. Um, so, as I mentioned before, very often I will use this guy, Crash Course in Biology, so you can always search under Crash Course and then put the topic in. Um, the video on amoeba, on the um, enzymes, is from the Amoeba Sisters, and you can just type in Amoeba, amoeba, <laughs> amoeba Sisters, and then enzymes, and that will pop it up. But I will get those links set up for you, okay? All right, let's watch our video on nucleic acids. Mesmerizing. It's double helix sighted. You really can't tell just by looking at it how sort of important and amazing it is. It's pretty much the most complicated molecule that exists and potentially the most important one. It's so complex that we didn't even know for sure what it looked like until about 60 years ago. It's so multifarious and awesome that if you took all of it from just one of our cells and untangled it, Side note, who discovered the three-dimensional shape of the nucleic acid? Does anybody know? This is a little bit of biological history here. Hint, was it a man or a woman? Anybody heard of this before? The person who actually discovered the three-dimensional shape of that double helix was a woman, Rosalind Franklin. 
and she did not get credit until much later for her discovery. The men in the lab got the credit for it because this was in the 1950s that this occurred. Okay, that was my side note. We'll continue on. It would be taller than me. You know, consider that there are probably 50 trillion cells in my body right now. Laid end to end, the DNA in those cells would stretch to the sun not once, but 600 times. Mind blown yet? Hey, you want to make one? Of course, you know, I'm talking about deoxyribonucleic acid, known to its friends as DNA. DNA is what stores our genetic instructions, the information that programs all of our cells' activities. It's a six billion letter code that provides the assembly instructions for everything that you are. And it does the same thing for pretty much every other living thing. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and assume that you are a human, in which case every body cell that you have or somatic cell in you has 46 chromosomes, each containing one big DNA molecule. These chromosomes are packed together tightly with proteins in the nucleus of the cell. DNA is nucleic acid and so is its cousin, which we'll also be talking about, ribonucleic acid or RNA. Now, if you can uh, make your mind do this, remember all the way back to episode three, where we talked about all the important biological molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins that are in the battle. Well, nucleic acids are the fourth major group of biological molecules, and for my money, they have the most complicated job of all. Structurally, they're polymers, which means that each one is made up of many small repeating molecular units. In DNA, these small units are called nucleotides. Link them together and you have yourself a polynucleotide. Now, before we actually put these tiny parts together to build a DNA molecule, like some microscopic piece of Ikea furniture, let's first take a look at what makes up each nucleotide. We're gonna need three things. One, a five carbon sugar molecule. Two, a phosphate group. And three, one of four nitrogen bases. DNA gets the first part of its name from our first ingredient, the sugar molecule, which is called deoxyribose. But all the really significant stuff, the genetic coding that makes you you, is found among the four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It's important to note that in living organisms, DNA doesn't exist as a single polynucleotide molecule, but rather a pair of molecules that are held tightly together. They're like an intertwined microscopic double spiral staircase, basically just a ladder but twisted the famous double helix. And like any good structure, we have to have a main support. In DNA, the sugars and the phosphates bond together to form twin backbones. These sugar phosphate bonds run down each side of the helix, but chemically in opposite directions. In other words, if you look at each of the sugar phosphate backbones, you'll see that one appears to be upside down in relation to the other. One strand begins at the top of the first phosphate connected to the sugar molecule's fifth carbon, and then ending where the next phosphate would go with a free end at the sugar's third carbon. This creates a pattern called five prime and three prime. I've always thought of the oxyribose with an arrow, with the oxygen as a point. It always points from three prime to five prime. Now on the other strand, it's exactly the opposite. It begins up top with a free end at the sugar's third carbon, and the phosphates connect to the sugar's fifth carbons all the way down. And ends at the bottom with the phosphate, and you probably figured this out already, but this is called the three prime, five prime direction. Now it is time to make ourselves one of these famous double helices. These two long chains are linked together by the nitrogenous bases via relatively weak hydrogen bonds. But they can't be just any pair of nitrogenous bases. Thankfully, when it comes to figuring out what part goes where, all you have to do is remember that if one nucleotide has an adenine base, only thymine can be its counterpart. Likewise, guanine can only bond with cytosine. These bonded nitrogenous bases are called base pairs. The GC pairing has three hydrogen bonds, making it slightly stronger than the AT base pair, which only has two. It's the order of these four nucleobases, or the base sequence, that allows your DNA to create you. So A, G, G, T, C, C, A, T, G means something completely different as a base sequence than, say, T, T, C, A, G, T, C, G. Human chromosome one, the largest of all of our chromosomes, contains a single molecule of DNA with 247 million base pairs. If you printed all of the letters of chromosome one into a book, it would be about 200,000 pages long. And each of your somatic cells has 46 DNA molecules tightly packed into its nucleus. That's one for each of your chromosomes. Put all 46 molecules together and we're talking about roughly six billion base pairs in every cell. This is the longest book that I've ever read. It's about a thousand pages long. If we were to fill it with our DNA sequence, we'd need about 10,000 of them to fit our entire genome. Pop quiz, let's test your skills using a very short strand of DNA. I'll give you one base sequence 
you give me the base sequence that appears on the other strand. Okay, here goes. So we've got a five prime AGG to CCG, to three prime, and times up the answer is three prime TCC AGGC five prime. See how that works? It's not super complicated. Since each nitrogenous base only has one counterpart, you can use one base sequence to predict what its matching sequence is going to look like. So, could I make the same base sequence as a strand of that other nucleic acid, RNA? No. Could not. RNA is certainly similar to its cousin DNA. It has a sugar phosphate backbone with nucleotide bases attached to it, but there are three major differences. One, RNA is a single-stranded molecule, no double helix here. Two, the sugar in RNA is ribose, which has one more oxygen atom than deoxyribose, hence the whole starting with an R instead of a D thing. And finally, RNA does not contain thymine. Its fourth nucleotide is the base uracil. So it bonds with adenine instead. RNA is super important to the production of our proteins, and you'll see later that it has a crucial role in the replication of DNA. But first. Biologrophies. Yes, plural this week, because when you start talking about something as multitudinously awesome and elegant as DNA, you have to wonder just who figured all this stuff out and how big was their brain? Well, Unsurprisingly, it actually took a lot of different brains in a lot of different countries and nearly a hundred years of thinking to do it. The names you usually hear when someone asks who discovered DNA are James Watson and Francis Crick, but that's bunk. They did not discover DNA, nor did they discover that DNA contained genetic information. DNA itself was discovered in 1869 by a Swiss biologist named Friedrich Misha. His deal was studying white blood cells, and he got those white blood cells in the most horrible way you could possibly imagine uh, from collecting used bandages from a nearby hospital. God. For science, he did it. He bathed the cells in warm alcohol to remove the lipids, and he set enzymes loose on them to digest the proteins. What was left after all of that was this snotty gray stuff that he knew must be some new kind of biological substance. He called it nuclein, what was later to become known as nucleic acid. But Misha didn't know what its role was or what it looked like. One of the scientists who helped figure that out was Rosalind Franklin, a young biophysicist in London nearly a hundred years later. Using a technique called X-ray diffraction, Franklin may have been the first to confirm the helical structure of DNA. She also figured out that the sugar phosphate backbone existed on the outside of the structure. So why is Rosalind Franklin not exactly a household name? Well, two reasons. One, unlike Watson and Crick, Franklin was happy to share data with her rivals. It was Franklin who informed Watson and Crick that an earlier theory of a triple helix structure was not possible. And in doing so, she indicated that DNA may indeed be a double helix. Later, pyramids confirming the helical structure of DNA were shown to Watson without her knowledge. Her work was eventually published in Nature, but not until after two papers by Watson and Crick had already appeared, in which the duo only hinted at her contribution. Even worse than that, Nobel Prize Committee couldn't even consider her for the prize that they awarded in 1962 because of how dead she was. The really tragic thing is that it's totally possible that her scientific work may have led to her early death of ovarian cancer at the age of 37. At the time, the X-ray diffraction technology that she was using to photograph DNA required dangerous amounts of radiation exposure, and Franklin rarely took precautions to protect herself. Nobel Prizes cannot be awarded posthumously. Many believe that she would have shared Watson Crick's medal if she'd been alive to receive. Not only are the basics of DNA structure, we need to understand how it copies itself, because cells are constantly dividing, and that requires a complete copy of all that DNA information. It turns out that our cells are extremely good at this. Our cells can create the equivalent of 10,000 copies of this book in just a few hours. That, my friends, is called replication. Every cell in your body has a copy of the same DNA. It started from an original copy and will copy itself trillions of times over the course of a lifetime each time using half of the original DNA strand as a template to build a new molecule. So, how is a teenage boy like the enzyme helicase? They both want to unzip your jeans. Helicase is marvelous. Unwinding the double helix at breakneck speed, slicing open those loose hydrogen bonds between the base. Okay, so we're getting ahead of ourselves with this part. This will be in our next chapter um, when we talk about the cell. We'll talk about cell division and replication and DNA replication. And then we'll come back and finish this last part of the video because it is great. His illustrations are fantastic when he to show what's actually happening. Um, I'm gonna add that part about history. So Francis Crick, Watson and Rosalind Franklin all played important roles 
Um, Rosalind Franklin did not get credit for her role. Um, she was kind of cheated out of it for many reasons. Um, so I think it's important that you know a little bit of history as well. Let's see. Let's go back to that. I'm going to check your chats. I think I saw there was some more chat. Oh, come on. Okay, let's see. So are we doing Zoom lecture next week too? Okay, that's a good question. I do not have my COVID results yet. So as far as you were concerned, we are doing Zoom next week, okay? So until I know what's the final result for that, we are gonna be continuing with Zoom. Um, I don't know if you got an email from SCC. There are some confirmed cases of COVID on campus. So for now, it's good to be safe and continue our Zoom lecture for class. Um, if and when that changes, I will be sure to let you know um, via email, okay? Um, are there other questions? Let me, um, let me double check to see if anybody joined late. Um, did Bailey join? Bailey, are you here? Jimmy? You in? I'm here. Oh, you in is here? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Is Araya here? Okay, well, that's good. We got UN in so she can have credit for being here today. Okay, we're gonna end just pretty much right on time today. You will have your, so we'll have our lecture Tuesday morning on Zoom, and then your quiz will be due that night. I plan to see, Okay, I'm going to be super honest. I'm going to the lake on Sunday. Yay, happy Labor Day. Um, I'm going to try to work on quizzes, setting them up Friday and maybe Saturday night. So by hopefully Sunday morning or Sunday evening at the latest, your quiz will be up and available for you. Okay, so I will try to post an email and let you know when the quiz is available. Until then, study your work. Um, so study what we've gone over, what will be on the quiz. Let's see, you did your first quiz involved just chapter one. Okay, so quiz two is gonna be over chemistry and macromolecules. So you have two basic topics that you need to study for this second quiz. And it's gonna be a little longer than last, the last quiz. It shouldn't be more than 20 questions, okay? Um, it won't be more than 20 questions, I promise. Um, it will all be multiple choice, just like the first one. Let's see. Anything else? Any questions? Okay. Um, you said those videos were the crash course biology? Yes. Okay. I will post those up. There will be... Um, Check in the module section later this evening. I won't have time till tonight to put them up, okay? But I will get those up for you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then we'll end for today. I hope you have a fantastic Labor Day and I'll see you on Tuesday. If you have questions between now and then, text me or shoot me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can, okay? Happy holiday. Bye, guys.